Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Trinity Community Church. There are a few extra notices before we begin. There is an edict which I'm commanded to read out by Presbytery, um, or else to tell you in potted form what it is. At the new Presbytery meeting on Thursday, 28th April, that's this Thursday, the new draft Presbytery mission plan will be considered covering the next five years or so. Where is it? It's in Haddington, St. Mary's Church at 7 p.m. and interested members of the congregation are welcome to attend. If you ask me for further information afterwards, I will tell you just to say about St. Mary's in Haddington. It has the same sort of rules that we have. You're welcome to wear a mask if you like, uh, and for the, or not to wear a mask if you like, but for the benefit of those um, who are wearing masks, could you wear a mask when you're moving about the church? Another thing that the Presbytery Clark has asked me to say is that we'll be singing hymn 565 and because they've invited all the churches in Presbytery to attend, there's a possibility that you might not see uh, the screens. Um, I think that's a fairly remote possibility myself uh, because St. Mary's is fairly big. Let's pause for a moment before we come to worship God. Please join with me in our call to worship. It's words from 1 Peter chapter 1, and they're on your screen now. Let us give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he gave us new life by raising Jesus Christ from death. This fills us with a living hope. Let's worship God. Let's think again on these words from our call to worship. Let's give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He gave us new life by raising Jesus from death, and that fills us with a living hope. Let's pray. Our loving God, we thank you that your purpose is to give life. That you've created life in the middle of this vast universe and you've renewed that life forever in the person of your own son, risen from death. And so we come with joy before you to worship and to adore you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, blessed forever. You are greater than we can imagine. The one who is, who was, and who is to come. We cannot contain you in our imagination, let alone in our worship. For you are very great. But we thank you that you love us and that Jesus came to die instead of us, to set us free from all our sins. We come as we are, wearing our frail humanity, which Jesus took upon himself to wear. Forgive us for anything that we have done wrong, or when we have failed to do what's right. We come not to wallow in guilt, but to admit our guilt before you so that you can deal with it. We tell you now about anything that is afflicting our spirit. Father, assure us of your forgiveness and help us to change by the wisdom of your word and by the power of your Spirit, according to your kind and gracious purpose, 
for us and with us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our reading today, the main reading, is from Revelation chapter 1. Um, and at that point, most people switch off because Revelation is a very hard book to understand. But it's not so hard to understand if you read chapter 1. John is writing to a group of churches he knows and loves very well. And he writes as a follower of Jesus and as a partner with them in enduring the suffering which he says comes to those who belong to his kingdom. We suffer, in other words, because Jesus is our king, but he gives us the strength to endure. Now, here sitting here in Pentecook, we might not be aware of that. Although I think every Christian who tries to live for God is aware of some of the hostility which comes our way because of Jesus and because we want to speak out for Jesus. But if you want to see real suffering, you have to, to go to the persecuted church in many lands. And these churches are beginning to see this hostility which is going to boil over in time into outright persecution from the very center of the state itself. And John is there and he's thinking about it and he's praying about it and he's meditating on the scriptures and he has this glorious vision of Jesus as the living one. Jesus says, I am the living one. I was dead, but now I am alive forever and ever. And I have authority over death and the world of the dead. In other words, you're not to be afraid of anything which can happen to you if you trust in Jesus. You're not to be afraid. Because Jesus is the king above all kings. And Jesus is the one who has the keys of death and the world of the dead. And these are two things which Christians are sometimes very afraid of. The power of the state or those in authority to do us harm. And the other thing what if I lose my life? And something that comes very strongly out of Revelation, out of that book, is the witness of those who love not their lives even though it meant dying for Jesus. Jesus himself said in Luke 21, it's a promise given to his followers. It starts off and it sounds very scary at first. People will arrest and persecute you. They'll hand you over to synagogues and prisons. They'll drag you before kings and governors because of my name. And it will be your opportunity to testify to them, to witness for me. So make up your minds not to worry beforehand how you'll attempt to defend yourselves. I'll, I will give you words and wisdom that none of your enemies will be able to oppose or prove wrong. Now, I'd be very surprised if we have to give up our lives in Pentecook. But in some ways we have to die to ourselves any time we tell people about Jesus. And I remember a family friend years ago, 
when I was a small child and the joy on her face when she realized that Jesus' promise was true. That when she was put in a situation where she had to de defend herself, defend her faith in Christ, that God gave her the words, that Jesus gave her the words and wisdom, and that <laughs> and there was joy in that, discovering that when we witness for Jesus, he stands by us and gives the words to us. Let's pray. Father, we know this is not an excuse for not doing the work beforehand, but we also know that it is a sure promise from you that you will uphold and strengthen us and give us the words and wisdom so that when we are called to account, we'll be able to give a good defense of our faith in you. In Jesus' name, we ask this for your help. Amen. Our first reading today is taken from Daniel chapter 7, reading verses 13 and 14. I was watching in the night visions, and with the clouds of the sky, one like the Son of Man was approaching. He went up to the Ancient of Days and was escorted before him. To him was given ruling authority, honour and sovereignty. All peoples, nations and language groups were serving him. His authority is eternal and will not pass away. His kingdom will not be destroyed. Amen. And our second reading, as John has alluded, is Revelation chapter 1, reading verse 4 to verse 20. This letter was written from John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace be yours from God, who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits in front of his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the first who was raised from death, and who is also the ruler of the kings of the world. He loves us, and by his sacrificial death, he has freed us from our sins and made us the kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. To Jesus Christ be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming on the clouds. Everyone will see him, including those who pierced him. All peoples on earth will mourn over him. So shall it be. I am the first and the last, says the Lord God Almighty, who is, who was, and who is to come. I am John, your brother, and as a follower of Jesus, I am your partner in patiently enduring the suffering that comes to those who belong to his kingdom. I was put on the island of Patmos because I had proclaimed God's word and the truth that Jesus revealed. On the Lord's day, the Spirit took control of me and I heard a loud voice that sounded like a trumpet speaking behind me. It said, write down what you see and send the book to the churches in these seven cities. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Theatra, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned round to see who was talking to me, and I saw seven gold lampstands. And among them there was what looked like a human being, wearing a robe that stretched to his feet, and a gold band round his chest. His hair was white as wool or as snow, and his eyes blazed like fire. His feet shone like brass that has been refined and polished, 
and his voice sounded like a roaring waterfall. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came out of his mouth. His face was as bright as the midday sun. When I saw him, I fell down at his feet like a dead man. He placed his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, but now I am alive for ever and ever. I have authority over death and the world of the dead. Write then the things you see, both the things that are now and the things that will happen afterward. Here is the secret meaning of the seven stars that you see in my right hand and of the seven gold lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Amen, and may God bless us these readings from his holy word. Let's pray. God our Father, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit on me as I speak and on all of us as we, we listen and think and think of the implications of what John is saying to us and what you are saying to us of being willing to offer up our lives or maybe our reputation or maybe our sense of well-being in the community to you and the assurance that you will stand by us even in the fires of hostility and that many people will be drawn to you. For you will draw to you the people whose hearts are yearning for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's look again at how John introduces himself. I am John, your brother, and as a follower of Jesus, I am your partner in patiently enduring the suffering that comes to those who belong to the kingdom. I was put on the island of Patmos because I proclaimed God's word and the truth that Jesus revealed. Patmos is a small, rocky, windswept island. It's in the Aegean Sea. It's in one corner of the Mediterranean. And it's quite near Ephesus. It's about 35 miles away. And it's relatively near the other churches where John was asked to send his book once he'd written down all he had experienced. Patmos is just off the coast of Asia Minor. That's the western coast of modern-day Turkey. Now, it would have been helpful if I had shown you a map, but then you would have thought about the map all day. Um, John wasn't on Patmos by choice. The Roman Empire had a habit of sending away undesirable people to islands in the Aegean. And it may have been a Roman penal colony, a colony that's like an Alcatraz of the ancient world. But John wasn't there because he was like Al Capone, he hadn't fiddled his taxes. He, Al Capone was the most famous inhabitant of Alcatraz. John was there because, as he says, he proclaimed God's word and the truth that Jesus revealed. In other words, he was a witness for Jesus and the state had sent him to Patmos to silence him. And the word he uses for being a witness is the word which we derive our word martyr from. Not as in, in she's a martyr to rheumatism or to describe a rather gloomy person who complains a lot. But the way we describe Christians who were witnesses for Christ even to the point of losing their lives. And John is among those who first used this word with that shade of meaning. 
persecution in John's day was getting bad. And he's passing on a warning to the churches that very shortly it's going to get much worse. Now before you write off John and his whole book as a doom and gloom merchant, consider this. In the first place, he was right. History bears him out. Eusebius, one of the first church historians, writing in the fourth century, records that even hostile non-Christian historians recorded this persecution and its martyrdoms in the latter part of the reign of the emperor Domitian. And that reign ended messily when Domitian was assassinated by members of the Senate in 96 AD. And in the second place, John's message isn't all doom and gloom. It starts off with a vision of the risen and exalted Jesus in the middle of seven gold lampstands, which John tells us are the seven churches that he's writing to. Jesus is in control of history, even though sometimes it doesn't seem like it. Jesus is in control of history and he's standing right in the middle of his persecuted churches. Now if you imagine John meditating on the Old Testament scriptures and praying on what he describes as the Lord's Day. That's possibly the first reference to the fact that Christians had started meeting on the first day of the week to honor Jesus who was resurrected that day. And John is separated unwillingly from his beloved churches who are probably like us celebrating the Lord's Supper while John is undergoing an enforced absence. And in the middle of his meditation, he hears a voice telling him to write down what he sees. And he turns and sees a vision of Jesus not as he was when he was on earth, which John would be well familiar with, but in his heavenly splendor. It's the sort of thing that somebody who's really soaked in scripture might see in a dream after pondering and praying for many days. That's the way that Tom Wright puts it. Because it's not just a visual image it's both visual and what you might call ideas made visible. And the words which Jesus speaks, for example, turn into a sword coming out of his mouth. And there are biblical images behind this. If you look at the word pictures in Isaiah of the coming king, it speaks of the rod of his lips. That's in Isaiah 9. And in the passages about the suffering servant where the prophet says, he made my mouth like a sharpened sword. That's in Isaiah 49. The images are of Jesus speaking powerfully, speaking truth, speaking justice and righteousness and with God's wisdom. And remember the promise which Jesus gave to his followers when they came up against all the power of the state and all the hostility against them. Remember what Jesus says in Luke 21. I will give you words and wisdom that none of your enemies will be able to oppose or prove wrong. That's if we come up against the power or the hostility of other people who, are in, who have more power or, in author or are in authority over us. And we come up against them because of our speaking about Jesus. In particular, in this passage, we see images that come from the book of Daniel, chapter 7. 
The background is the terrible persecution of God's people in that day. And we see through Daniel's eyes the Ancient of Days seated upon a throne of judgment and you'll recognize some of the imagery that John uses. His clothing was as white as snow and the hair of his head was white like wool. And one like a son of man is brought before him. In other words, a human being is brought forward. And he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. And that's a constant theme in Revelation. It's picked up again and again. As Tom Wright says, in John's vision, these two figures, the figure of the Ancient of Days and the figure of the Son of Man from Daniel 7, seem to have merged. And when we're looking at Jesus, he's saying, we are looking straight through him at the Father himself. On Easter Sunday, there was an opportunity to watch the sun come up over Pentecost at the sunrise service. Now, I, you can't see it happen all that often and I can't personally witness it because I wasn't at that service but I was exhausted from all the services that went before. So, was anyone, could anyone tell me if the sun came up in Pentecost that morning? No. There were some clouds in the sky but it did brighten up. And okay. Well, right, with sunny intervals later. But you, you can't watch the sun in its full strength at its noonday height because your retinas would burn out and it would be the last thing you'd see. And John says of Jesus, his face was as bright as the midday sun and when I saw him, I fell down at his feet like a dead man. In the Old Testament, it says that no one can see God and live. But John merely has the feeling, he feels as if he's dead. But through Jesus, he can approach God. Now, this is a vision that's both scary and deeply reassuring because this sovereign one clothed in majesty, the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, is also our great high priest, the one who represents us before God. And his garments speak of authority and power that are greater than Caesar's and all the provincial governors and client kings of the Roman Empire put together. This is the ruler of the kings of the world. But his garments also speak of the priestly role he has. And part of a job of a priest in the temple was to tend the lampstands, to keep their light burning clear. And John, remember, is using the lampstands as a picture of the churches. Jesus wants our witness, the witness of all his churches to be purified and be a clear burning light that's visible to people around. And besides that, the priests of old had a role to perform sacrifices for the sins of the people. But this high priest, Jesus, has a unique role. As John says at the start of his letter to the churches, he loves us. And by his blood, by his sacrificial death, he has freed us from our sins and made us a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. He has a burning love for his people from before the dawn of time and through his death and resurrection he's liberated them and put them to new work in his kingdom to represent him in the world 
and to bring its people in prayer before him. And one day he will come back to set up his just and peaceful rule on earth. As it is in heaven. And that's the vision of Jesus. That John wants to bring to the suffering churches. And I believe it's a vision which, which God wants us to concentrate on today. Because sometimes this work of witness is going to be hard. Not because Jesus makes it hard. But because of the hostility of people around us. Now you won't always meet with hostility. Some people will will almost grab at you. They're so eager to hear your message. As John says to his hearers, I share with you in the hardship, the kingdom and endurance that we have in Jesus. Now that's a strange way of of bringing the words together, of hardship and endurance with kingdom, because the kingdom means God's sovereign rule. But that's very nearly the, the whole point of the book. Jesus won his victory through suffering and death and his people are sometimes called to do the same. To witness for Jesus even to the point of losing their lives or their reputation or their well-being in the community. Let's pray that we're ready for that. We pray, Father, that you would help us to grasp these great teachings about what your Son did in order to open the way into your presence and love. How you're going to come back and judge all things and how you're with your people in all our hardship and suffering. We pray you would help us to apply these things by your Holy Spirit And that we wouldn't shrink away from witnessing for you because it's hard. That that you would fix in our minds this picture of Jesus as above every rule and authority. Having the keys of of death and and the world of the dead. in control of history and you would give us great boldness take away our fear in Jesus name Amen Heavenly Father we approach your throne of grace thank you Lord for every blessing you have poured out on us this week Lead your people here into a strong and loving fellowship, ready to reach out our hands to those in need and to bear powerful witness to your name. We thank you for the sun which set last night and rose this morning in the continuum of your creation. Father of all nations and all people, we cry out to you for Ukraine and Russia, for every adult, for every child. We long for a time when weapons of war are discarded and destroyed. Show us the way of peace that is your overwhelming presence. Protect those whose only desire is to live in security and peace. And with your loving arms, envelop those who fear for their lives and the lives of their loved ones. Bring comfort to the bereaved Lord. Transform the hearts of those set in violence, aggression and domination and give wisdom to all leaders that leads to peace. Loving Abba, we pray for other nations in the world, for Ethiopia, Syria, Haiti, Lebanon, the Congo, Myanmar, Iraq, Sudan and Venezuela and many more where there is civil unrest, political instability, violence 
devastating lack of food and medical care, homelessness and fear. We remember all those who have fled their homeland in search of a safe place to live, away from conflict, persecution and deprivation. Evoke in us all a passion for justice and a reminder that we all have a part to play in peace and equality. Father, we pray for hearts that will respond. Touch your creation, Lord, with compassion, with the words of your Son. Touch our wealth that it may be shared to bring the end to suffering and to bring love to all these situations, returning laughter to the hearts and faces of the children. Lord, we lift before you our own country and we pray this morning for our government. We ask for wisdom and the courage to do what is right no matter how narrow the gate, for honesty and truth and a heart for peoples throughout the world. We ask for grace and strength for those in power, Lord. Grant them the resolve and steadfastness to stand against temptation and discrimination and the dedication to lead this country to a place of reconciliation. Keep us all from an indifference and ignorance of each other. In a world driven by greed and the desire for power and conquest, we ask for leaders whose hearts are at one with Jesus. Jehovah, raise up people of Christ who will stand for goodness, mercy, equality and love. We lift before you all students preparing to sit national exams in the coming weeks and ask that you will bless them with strength and remove any fear and trepidation. Bless our children, Lord, that they may see a time of prevailing peace in our world and a hope for their future. Help us to lead them by example and word into a relationship with you that is bountiful and grace-filled. We pray for the National Health Service, recovering in part from the impact of COVID-19, and bring before you all those who are still afflicted by this pandemic. Restore them to health, Lord, and wipe this virus from the face of the earth. We remember our own community and the places where we serve. Renew 26, inspire all involved to bring friendship and fellowship to all our guests. For FFF and North Church Food Bank, Thank you, Lord, that you have led so many of your people to serve in these places, and we lift into your loving arms all those who are users of these resources. We ask blessing on all those who lead, grant them knowledge, understanding, and love. We pray for Forest Church and the new housing project, so many new families coming to Pennycook. Guide us, Father, in how to reach out. Loving Lord, we pray for people seeking work in these difficult times and ask that you grace them with hope and successful outcomes as they search. Lay upon our hearts your calling in our lives and open doors to our hands and hearts that we might serve. Let our loving witness show that we are a family of Christ in our community. Heavenly Father, pour out your blessings, your strength, your knowledge and grace upon this new church of Pennycook Trinity Community. Help us to excite people for the gospel through our lives and the constant gossiping of your word. Give us eyes to see the needs of our neighborhoods and the courage and love to be the people who bring change in your name. Rain down the Holy Spirit upon John and Peter as they create the path that we travel and prepare for us the journey. Bless the offerings brought before you today and guide us in the use of this resource in Jesus' name. Let's take the short time to pray for those who are in each of our hearts in silence. Let us say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. 
just a word about how communion is done because we did it for the first time this way uh, last time and you maybe weren't here or maybe like me you've got a bad memory and you've forgotten um, the serving team who are in front of me will bring you the bread and the wine in the pews they'll pass between you so um, we've left a, a gap for them to do that and once you get the bread if you can retrain it and then we can eat it together we can't share the bread together but we can eat it together as a sign of our unity in Christ and the same with the wine and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all this is the table of the Lord and he invites all who love him and trust in him alone for their salvation to sit with him and share in this feast why do we come to this table we come to this table because of Jesus command and invitation to remember him Jesus tells us to eat this broken bread and to drink this cup in true faith and to keep doing so until he comes again. How is this meal different from all others? In this supper, God tells us that our sins have been completely forgiven through the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, where his body was broken and his blood was shed. And God also tells us that the Holy Spirit makes us one with Christ and in Christ with all other Christians. Come then, people of God, to this joyful feast of our Lord, and let's give God our thanks and praise. Let's pray. Loving God, you made this world marvelous for us to enjoy. And you gave Jesus to be our Savior, Lord, and friend, and to bring us to you. And you send your Spirit to make us one family in Christ. For these free gifts of love, we thank you. And we join with angels and saints in this joyful hymn of praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. For your kindness to us and your goodness to all, we give you thanks. We thank you that you showed your love by sending your Son who gave his life for us and rose again from death and lives to pray for us and to represent us in heaven forever. We thank you that he has taken away all that separates us from you and has made us friends with you and with one another. We thank you that he has brought us together at this table to strengthen us by his love. Send your Holy Spirit on us to bless these gifts of bread and wine to us that we may know Christ's presence, real and true, and be his faithful followers, showing your love to the world. And we join together and say, through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Why do we eat this bread? The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. We remember and believe 
that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was given for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. Why do we drink the cup? The cup for which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. We remember and believe that the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was shed, was poured out for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. Come, for all is ready. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ which is broken for you. Do this, remembering him. This cup is the new covenant sealed by Christ's blood which was shed that the sins of many might be forgiven. Drink from it, all of you. When Jesus rose from the dead, he came and stood among his friends and showing them his hands and his side, he said, peace be with you. And so I say to you, in his name and in his risen presence, the peace of the Lord, Jesus, be with you all. Let's pray. God, our Redeemer, you have delivered us from death in the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ and brought us to new life by the power of your Spirit. Give us grace to keep our promises, to witness for you, and to praise and serve you all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Go in peace. And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.